Revelation chapter 20 this morning as we finish our, our study in end times, uh, again, springboarding off of 1 Thessalonians where we're studying through, and we'll see more and talk more of, no doubt, the, uh, the eschatology uh, as we get into chapter, the second Thessalonians because it's, it's filled with future events as well. But this morning, looking at the millennium and beyond and try to do a, a quick study in that. Again, I encourage all of you to get into the word, get into your own study on this. It's exciting. It really uh, settles our heart and prepares us t- to be looking up for our redemption, draws nigh, as the Bible will tell us and the excitement of what is coming. Let me tell you, um, in studying this uh, and knowing that Jesus can come at any time or we, our bodies could give way and we could give our last breath on earth and looking toward heaven, I enjoy being a husband and I enjoy being a grandfather. If you're on my Facebook, you know that. I enjoy being a, a father and Enjoy being a pastor and becoming before you guys. I enjoy what's going on on earth, okay? And so I struggle sometimes with that, but the Lord tells me it's going to be even better. People ask me, well, are we going to be married in heaven? No, no, I don't believe we're going to be married, but it's going to be better than marriage. Doesn't mean we're not going to be brothers and sisters in Christ and friends. I hope you're a friend with your spouse. Hope you guys are, see, we practice here on earth what we're supposed to be doing in heaven. It's going to be better, and I, got, I tell myself that as my grandkids surround me and, and, and I spoil them, you know, because that's what I do. And, my, and not my kids, but my grandkids, but uh, I spent all my kids' uh, college funds raising them. But so, so, yeah, there's that, I mean, let's be honest, there's that sense that some of you are saying, no, man, I'm ready to go right now. And that's okay, too. That's, that's, I guess that's the attitude we should have. But on the other half, we're so glad, we're so blessed to know that as we are enjoying what we have in family, uh, it's going to even be better. So just think of that. Father, we thank you for this time that you've given to us. Lord, already we know the enemy doesn't want this message or doesn't even want this service to happen, Lord. Not so much the message, but the sermon. Not too much the sermon, but, but just this whole service. And so we, we ask that you would be glorified, magnified, God that you would just uh, keep us focused, Lord, for the next few minutes as we look to uh, your word, God, and to the future. God, we haven't been there yet, but we know the word of God says what it says, and we believe it, and uh, we just ask again Lord, that we would leave here different than the way we came and, and more, uh, have more insight, Lord, in, in, in what is yet to come. But we ask it in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Well, last week we looked at the second coming to earth we looked at uh, the events that would take place after the second coming. We looked at Jesus coming to earth uh, with his church, uh, landing on the Mount of Olives, right? And as soon as he lands there, of course, we know that there will be a battle going on uh, known as the Battle of Armageddon. He will battle the beast who is the Antichrist and his armies, and they will be defeated, of course. And John the Apostle continues the narrative of these end time events leading up to the millennium. That's what this was all about. He was coming back the second time, which is, again, to prepare for the millennium. Again, which is the binding of Satan for a duration of a thousand years and to give man, saved man, what we've always wanted on earth. And that is a kingdom where Jesus Christ rules. A kingdom where we can, can roam and walk about and just, like I said, it gets, it, it's even better than what we have today. This kingdom where Jesus will be ruling, this is what the millennial kingdom will be like. Uh, it's, it's amazing when you start studying it and reading it, what, 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 what we have to look forward to, uh, this duration of what we call a thousand years. Revelation 20, but it begins with Satan being bound. Look at Revelation 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven. It's interesting. Having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. 
And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. He, he, he gives us a definition of the dragon. And bound him for what? A thousand years, yeah. And, and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. I like that. Shut up, Satan. And set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And we'll explain that here in a minute. So those thousand-year references that John uses, I believe there's, uh, oh, it's, it's referenced, what, one, two, uh, three, four, six times, I guess, just in the first uh, six verses of Revelation 20. Those are the references that speak of a period when, again, God's people will live and reign with Jesus on earth, this earth, guys, for that thousand-year reign. Now, I'm all about green. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, like the liberals are today. I'm, I'm angry that gas prices have gone up almost 75 cents since the new administration, but be that as it may. I'm all about green, keeping our, our country clean, uh, picking up papers, you know, uh, tilling the ground, making sure the soil and all that is good. Don't get me wrong. But the fact is they try to scare us and say this earth is going to blow up and go away. No, it's not. We're coming back to this earth. We're coming back for a thousand. Now, it may not look much like, like much, but we're coming back, and Jesus is going to rule in, on this earth, this earth, okay? He's going to rule. According to the Bible, he's going to rule on this earth for a thousand years. Now, the word thousand years we get there is helioi, and that word in the Greek means a thousand, and etos means a year. The Latin equivalent is millennium. Of course, a thousand years, where we get our title, the millennium. That's why we just titled it that. We could say for a thousand year period, but millennium sounds better, right? At least smart scholars like to use these long words and, and they like to say that. But millennium, and that's how we get this. So it's a, a thousand year period. So Satan now is bound for a thousand years. And then the participants of the millennium, look at verses four and six. It says, and I saw thrones and, and they sat on them and, and judgment was committed to them. And then I saw souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and, and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, it says there. I saw thrones and they that sat on them and judgment, he says, was committed to them. Who are the they there? And the saints that accompanied Jesus to earth, and as John went on to say, that these were the ones who are the tribulation saints we spoke of about last week. Then I saw the souls of those who were beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. The tribulation saints. Now we, This is a little bit of review from last week. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. Now, before that, it says, but the rest of the dead, and I would put a parenthesis there right after that, if, if you would. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Who are the rest of the dead? Those are the wicked dead. I'm going to try to slow down because this can get a little, a little mind-boggling and we don't have our, our slides. So the rest of the dead are the wicked dead. They're, they're not coming back with Jesus on the second coming and setting up the millennial period. Thus is the first resurrection, he says. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Now, I didn't mention this on the first service last week, and I did on the second service, but the, the first resurrection begins again with Christ, who is the first what? The first fruits. The second phase of the first resurrection is the church. And those who died in Christ, those are, that's called the harvest and then the tribulation saints are referred to as the gleaners. So you have the whole uh, agricultural idea as the scripture speaks about with Jesus being the first fruits. Remember the first fruits was the offering the priest would go in when they first got the first of the, of the fruits of the har before the harvest came, which, which promised them that the harvest was coming. 
And then, and then they would go out and harvest the field and bring in the wonderful harvest. But they were not allowed to glean afterwards, were they? The gleanings were left for those of the poor, those who were uh, without. And the gleaning would come in and they would do the corners and they would catch anything that the, the harvesters missed. They were not allowed to go back. And so we have kind of that picture here. We have the picture of the first fruits of Jesus, the harvest, which was the, the church, the harvest, which was the rapture of the church, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up into heaven with Jesus. And then the gleaners are, are those of the tribulation saints, and some believe the Old Testament saints at this point will get their bodies. Uh, last week, I believe it was the Old Testament saints will get their resurrected bodies along with the church. Uh, next week, uh, Ask me, maybe I changed my mind, because there's two different views on that, and they both fit great. Again, over the such, the second death has no power. Over such, the second death has no power. The second death, think about that. Born once, die what? Born twice, that's right, born again. These of the wicked dead were only born once. They refuse to be born again. They refuse to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. They refuse to walk in accordance to God's word. So these are those who have the second death. But those of us who have been born again, we will be with Christ there. We will be with him. We've been born again. We, we do want to die once. That's the natural death. But we're born twice and we live forever with Christ. And it says, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. It will be at this time, uh, if I can just review with you, that Jesus will separate the sheep and the goats. Again, the survivors of the tribulation period. The goats' souls will be cast into uh, Hades, awaiting judgment. That's going to be a trip. That's the second death. But the sheep will be allowed to enter into the kingdom set up for a thousand years. This is so important. You got it? So when we, we're going to come back to the, to the earth, the second coming, right? And we're going to have a battle, and we're going to win. And there's a 75-day period that, that Jesus is getting the kingdom set up. He's, 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 he's taking care of business. And during that time, it's the separation of the sheep and the goats. The goats go to Hades, awaiting the final judgment. The sheep who did not take the mark of the beast, who did not serve Satan, who did their best to, to follow Christ, who realized they were fooled by the Antichrist. Those are the ones, the sheep, are going to be allowed to go into the kingdom. Okay? So important. you got to understand that. They will be allowed to enter the kingdom set up for a thousand years. The sheep who are allowed to go into the kingdom, friends, listen, are still mortal. They're like us right now. Okay? They're still mortal. That's so important to understand. But they're saved. And yet they're saved at an interesting time because as they're separated, as the, as, as the, uh, you know, the, uh, the wheat from the chaff, as they're separated, then they get to go into the kingdom with us. And listen, please, they will continue to marry. They will continue to be given marriage. They will continue to procreate. They will, they will continue to fill the millennial kingdom. They will be mortal. We are, we won't. Or, or if, you know, as we're caught up in the rapture, we won't, we'll be what? In our, our new resurrected bodies. This, this mortal must put on what? Immortality. That's going to happen at the rapture. We're going to get our new bodies. Okay, I'm trying to explain it. Okay, this ain't easy. I wonder why the enemy don't want it spoken of. But those who are left behind, uh, the nation of Israel, many there, uh, God has a special place for them too, uh, to hide them and protect them. Gentiles as well, who realize, you know, wow, I, uh, I've been fooled. Now, if they're beheaded, if they're killed during the tribulation period, their bodies will go to to, their soul, excuse me, will go to be with the Lord, and then at the second coming, they will get their resurrected bodies. We looked at that last week. But um, those who survive to the bone and are, are standing before God, he separates them, and he, they're allowed to go into the middle of the kingdom. I'm kind of overdoing it, but I just want you to understand that they'll be mortal, and they'll be having kids. 
and they'll be filling the millennial kingdom as well, okay? Moving right along, what's the purpose for the millennium then? What's the purpose for the millennium? Number one, to award the faithful saints, the church, those of you and me who are walking with Christ, with the promised positions of authority. Once again, well, I don't need authority, man. I just want to go there. I want to just sweep the streets of gold and all this. No, no, you're going to be given authority. It's promised authority. If you're taking notes, Matthew 19, 28, you can look at it later. In 1 Corinthians 6, 2 through 3, we'll be sitting on thrones. We'll be given authority over angels, authority over, no doubt, these uh, millennial sheep who are allowed to go in. We'll be working for God who sits on that throne. And it's, 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 it's promised to us. Number two, to fulfill the, the Davidic covenant. To fulfill the Vit, Davidic covenant. 2 Samuel 7, 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 13. I'll read it to you. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed. Now this is God speaking to David. I will set up your seed after you who will come from my body or excuse me, will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That promised covenant will become to completion during the millennial period. Come to completion during the millennial period. He will establish this on this earth. Uh, also, uh, to redeem creation. It groans right now, doesn't it? Doesn't Paul tell us that, that the creation is just groaning? It's just, you know, it, it's, it's crying out. It's a time where God reverses the curse. It's a time where, where uh, here we see that he reverses the curse from the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve fell. The, the, the earth is going to be restored as close as its original start and glory. And this will affect the whole environment, guys. This is the green deal. Amen? You want a green deal? It's coming. It's coming, folks. Isaiah 11, 6 through 9. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and young lion and fatling together. And a little child shall, uh, shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, and so on. And there are more verses that you can study in that. This is why the millennium will be, and this is something that we're going to witness as Christians. And it's going to blow our mind to see that, you know. It's also to bring about a time of peace and no war. Now, there will be a war at the end, but that, if you want to call it a war, as Satan rebels, and we'll talk about that in a second, but really that's not really no war because as soon as they rebel, then they're done. They're done. But Micah 4, 3, it says, He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowed plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks nations shall not lift up sword against nation and neither shall they learn war anymore and there are much much more but one that really shocked me was here at the end of the millennium and it's to reaffirm the total depravity of man revelation 27 through 9 now, when the thousand years have expired, that's Bible for end, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog, and this is not talking about Ezekiel 38 and 39, although some believe that this is, another belief is that this, Gog and Magog are just the enemies, just the enemies of God, to gather them together to battle, whose number is the sand of the sea, and they went up on the breadth of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. What, what do you think the beloved city is? Jerusalem, yeah. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Boop. Boop. But 
notice with me, guys. These who are tempted, these who join the enemy when he's released, these are the descendants, the children of the tribulation saints who survive the tribulation, enter the millennial in their natural bodies. And no doubt, outwardly, they, outwardly, they uh, have been required to conform to the rule of the king and make a, possess- a profession uh, of obedience to Christ. But inwardly, what's the heart of the matter? It's the matter of the heart. Oh, Christ will reign and, and they will be in obedience to that reign. They, they will go with the program that's laid out for them. They, they, they will go with it. But internally, you can't make a man do anything. That man has to make that change within his heart. This is also a purpose to show again the total depravity of man. Now, these are natural people now, okay? As I said, these are the sheep. And these are the descendants of the sheep who are allowed to come into the kingdom. Their offspring. Not all of them, but many of them. It says, as the sand, as the sea, of the, uh, as, uh, as the sand of the sea, whose number is as great. But this is what blows me away. Here are these offspring of these believers who are allowed to live and live beyond 100 years old, the Bible says. Uh, if a man dies at 100 years old, the scriptures tell us uh, it would be shocking to the people because it was as if a little child was d- died. Here's the offspring of these sheep. Not all, but some, most, some, whatever the number is. It's, it's a great number. Who have lived to see Jesus Christ personally. Because he is going to reign personally, visibly, on that throne. To, to see what love, true love is and grace and mercy to be corrected when they do a wrong and, and things. And yet, they're going to reject Jesus Christ because it's the heart. God knows our hearts. He knows every one of our hearts here today and every heart that is there in, in, in home. He knows all of our hearts. And yet, they're going to they're gonna outwardly, they'll have, you know, obedience. But inwardly, they're wicked. And sinful. And there will be these descendants who will gather with the enemy and they would prove that their outward conformity was nothing because their heart will speak loudly when he, Satan dece- deceives these and they go against God. That's a, 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 and so the question is why is, he, why is he released? Why isn't he just judged at that point? Scholars believe because to show the depravity of man, to show how, how depraved man can be, even in the most perfect environment, just like the garden. Adam and Eve was in the most perfect environment anyone could ha- ever be in, right? And still, still, they didn't have really, uh, uh, you know, it, they were just perfect. They, they, they you know, there was the tree of good and evil. They had a choice. They had their own will, you know, and, and they choose to allow the enemy to deceive them in the most perfect environment. Some of you are saying, man, I wish I had the most perfect marriage, the most perfect house, the most perfect job, the most, just, hey, God, if you give me the most perfect marriage, job, house, kids, <laughs> I, I will serve you. Look at, there couldn't get any more perfect than the Garden of Eden. You couldn't get any more perfect than the millennial period. And yet, there's still some, the natural men and women that Satan was able to deceive. It was their willful choice. And there's the Jesus visibly, the Lord Jesus. And there's Satan playing his card because his card has not changed. This card is still to deceive in a great number, it says, as the sand of the sea came against him to fight against his saints. Dwight Pentecost writes, the millennial age is designed by God to be the final test of fallen humanity under the most ideal circumstances. Circumstances, Surrounded by every enablement to obey the rule of the king. And yet they refuse to do that. 
It's to prove to us, too, that, you know, man has a choice, as we had a choice to receive Christ. We can reject him or receive him. It's up to us. And it's God's way of really showing that uh, in a live illustration. It's just how, how deprived man can be. Hitchcock says, to once and for all demonstrate the true nature of man, that he is sinful both by nature and practice. And as we read, it's also the end of the millennial period is to judge Satan finally. Verse 10, look at 2010. It says, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone Now notice this, where the what? The beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Hell is eternal. Okay? Hell is eternal. And just the mention of the beast and the false prophet who were thrown in there a thousand years prior argues against annihilation because people say it's annihilation. I've got family members who believe that you live like a light bulb. And once it goes out, you take the light bulb out, put it in a little package and throw it away. That's what they believe. And they live for this world because it's just annihilation. We're just going to be annihilated. We're not, no, that's not true. A thousand years later, he still speaks of the beast and the false prophet are presently or at that time, during that time. Hell was designed for who? Satan. And yet man, because of his unrepented sinfulness, sends himself there by rejection and stepping over the crucified body of Jesus Christ, the love that God had shown the, the greatest demonstration of love. You step right over it. And it's, your, it's, it's up to you. You can do that if that's what you want. You send yourself there. You send yourself to the place of torment. You send yourself to the fire and brimstone. And you send yourself there forever and ever. If that's anyone here, you can change that. You can change it. None of us can make you But we can plead with you. But we don't want anyone. And God doesn't want anyone to go there. There has to be a place. There has to be some place for that. And this is where it is. Then in verse 20, verse 11, the great white throne judgment. So Satan is now thrown into this lake of fire. He's he's done. And everybody said, (laughs) in Jesus' name. But now there's the judgment of the wicked dead. Those goats and everyone from back in the, you know, from, uh, uh, who is it? Uh, um, who? Cain, yeah, thank you, Cain. All the way, look at, look at verse 11. And this is John writing, of course. And I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heavens fled away. Guess who that is? How about Jesus. And there was found no place for them. And this breaks my heart. It really breaks my heart. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Small and great guys like Caiaphas and Annas and Herod and Pilate and all who passed judgment on Jesus now stand before the king of kings. The king of kings is still, by the way, bearing the scars the scars of Calvary, the scars of the crucifixion, crucifixion, the scars of which they approved to put part, to have put upon our Lord and Savior. Think about that. Then it call, talks about, look at, and the books, plural, were opened, and another book, singular, was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by things which were written in the books. So God somehow is keeping a, a, you know, a track. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. The death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged. 
says, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire along with Satan, the Antichrist, and others. And he says again, this is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There will be a judge, but there will be no jury. A prosecution with no defense and a sentence with no appeal. It's done. The Bible tells us every knee shall bow. Amen. Every tongue shall confess. Friends, do it now and mean it sincerely from your heart. Confess Christ now as Lord and Savior. Why would you wait until you stand before the judgment and sentence has been already been, been laid out? You will. You will kneel and you will confess that this is Lord. But then it's too late. There are a lot of believers in, in Hades right now, guys. There are, everybody in Hades is a believer, but it's too late. That breaks your heart, doesn't it? They were fooled, man, deceived. Fooled and deceived, man. The rich man in Lazarus, read it, Luke. It's real. Okay. Have Lazarus come and just get some water on his fingers and, and dip my, my, touch my tongue. All the senses that we have today, the rich man had in Hades. All our senses, sight, touch, pain, you know, name all the seven senses and they were there. Go back, read Luke, I think it's uh, 16. Read it, read it in the daytime. Don't read it before you go to bed. But seriously, and ask yourself, who are you? Are you the rich man or are you Lazarus? Are you going to be comforted by God or are you going to be tormented, awaiting more torment in hell? Well, I don't want to leave you at, a, at the white, great white throne judgment. Let's go beyond the millennium. Let's look at Revelation 21 now. Revelation 21 Verse 1 says, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Praise the Lord, man. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And also there was no more sea. So you surfers, I'm sorry, sailors, uh, uh, deep water fishers, you know, deep, deep sea fishermen. Then I, saw, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. From God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. When I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. Guys, it's going to be an interesting place. And they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. The word new used here is kinos. It means new or fresh. And as I'm studying, there are actually men that I respect, but they believe it's not going to be new, that they say it's going to be... Uh, recreated. Uh, scholars believe the world will not be destroyed, but recreated. Others believe it will be renewed and transformed. I renewed and transformed here. Huh? But they say, no, it's going to be uh, renovated. It's not going to be, re it's not going to be transformed. It's not going to be, it's going to be re, you know, it's just renovated rather than recreated. I think that's the words I'm trying to get out of my mouth. You, you, you can make your own, uh, Decision. You won't lose your salvation however you look at it. 
Because some of the guys I read, I can not believe it. I never heard of that before. It, to me, it says new, right? I mean, coming out of heaven. Uh, to me, it says uh, passed away. Uh, but, you know, they can be wrong, and we love them still anyway. No. There'll be a new Jerusalem, he says. 21, 10, and 11 says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me a great city, the holy Jerusalem, descended out of heaven from God. Verse 11, having the glory of God. Verses 22 and 23, but I saw no temple in it. I'm sorry, we just, you know, have by it for time. We just got to move on. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Verse 23, the city had no need of sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. There's a river of life, it says. Look at chapter 22, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and, and the Lamb in the middle of its street. And on the other side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. We could partake of it. This will be heaven on earth. We will be with God. We will, we will be there for the new Jerusalem. And, a, and there will be a, a lot of no mores there. And I find it interesting that after the great right throne judgment, he speaks of this, of this, uh, this new heaven and this new earth where God comes down and lives with man. That we will have access to God. That it's Jesus who makes all things new. And I think it's wonderful. The bottom line is, it's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and we will live and be with Jesus forever. Forever. Some have described this new heaven and earth as a place of no mores. Uh, I, I brought a reference out here. This is out of the book, um, The End, I've been referencing. Let me just read to you concerning the no mores, as we read here, but... This is from Stephen Lawson. He says, there will be no, no funeral homes, no hospitals, no abortion clinics, no divorce courts, no lawyers. Sorry, uh, I added that one, but that's from our brother out there. No bankruptcy courts, no psychiatric wards. There will be no pornography, no teen suicide, no AIDS, no cancer. Praise God. No rape, no missing children, no drug problems, no drive-by shootings, no racial tensions, no prejudice. There will be no misunderstandings, no injustice, no depression, no hurtful words, no gossip, no hurt feelings, no worry, no emptiness, no child abuse. There will be no wars, no financial worries, no emotional heartaches, no physical pain, no spiritual flatness, no relational divisions, no murders, no casserole. <laughs> no casseroles, but anyway... I just got it. This guy's being funny. There will be no tears, no suffering, no separation, no starvation, no arguments, no accidents, no emergency, no doctors, no nurses, no heart monitors, no rust, no, no perplexing questions, no false teachers, no financial shortages, no hurricanes, bad habits, decay, no locks. We will never need to confess sin. The nose of the new heaven and the new earth. Well, I'll leave you with man's last warning. Uh, specific to Revelation, sure, but it's, it's Jesus' words as well and what John was asked to write. And this is for man now. Before these events take place, he says in 21.5, look at 21.5, the the middle of five, we say 21, five B. Right, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, the Lord, God, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. 
He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexual immoral, the sorcerers, the adulterers, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Jesus says, behold, I I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Jesus says, and behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Jesus says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you, John, these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. The thing is, are we going to obey Jesus? Are we ready? Are we watchful? Are we ready today? Are we ready today if he came for the church? Would we go? Will we be taken with him to meet him in the air? Let's pray. Father, thank you, God. In the midst of all this chaos here, Lord, and this working and that not working, Lord, the bottom line is you're always working. (laughs) Your program never stops, God. If we have to come, go down, if, if we have to end up with just a, Lord God, a, a, no microphones and, and nothing, God, we'll still preach the word. We'll still bring your word to life, God. Father, I just pray, Lord, for all of us. I pray for prodigals that, that we know of, God, sons and daughters, family members and spouses who are not yet to make their commitment to you, God. When we read these things, yes, God, it excites us but it also brings a bit of pain, Lord, because we don't want our loved ones to leave this earth without you. We don't want our friends. And, and really, Lord, like you, we're, we're not willing that any should die without you, God, that any should see punishment. Father, please, God, speak to our personal friends and loved ones who know you not yet. Lord, please open their hearts, God, Father, right now, they may be sleeping. They may uh, be, uh, Lord, sleeping in maybe because they they over-inebriated themselves last night. But even in that, in that state, Lord, Lord, we just ask that you would speak to them, that you would break through as you did with Paul on that road of Damascus, God. You went and met him, and he was a different man after that, Lord. For anyone here today, God, that that has come in here and outwardly, Lord, to us, they may look like Christians, smell like a Christian, dress like a Christian. I don't know, God, but you know the heart. Deal with our hearts, God. Deal with the hearts of all here today and those watching online. And if any don't know you, Lord, I pray that that would change today. It's a simple prayer, friends, if you're here or watching just a very simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I am a sinner in need of a Savior. And what you did on Calvary and dying there, and the third day rising again, we confess with our mouth, Lord, what our heart, what our heart has dealt with. And from the depths of our hearts, God, just pray out, Jesus, save me. Save me, God. And for those of us who are saved, God, be with us, Lord. Walk with us. Uh, Give us uh, continual uh, discernment and help us, God, to keep focused as we go day to day in this world, Lord, in our jobs or raising kids or, or doing what you've called us to do in ministry knowing that one day you're going to call us home, God. And we're ready, Lord. Come now, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Amen. God bless you guys.